So what I want to talk about today, um, and this is a shameless plug, um, are some issues that um, I deal with in a book that's just about to come out uh, called Atmosphere Trees on the allure of elemental development. Uh, I couldn't get the image any bigger. Um, um, and uh, I, I, I put a really wanted to, to show it because I'm terrible usually at the, um, uh, promoting my own work. So I've been told I need to do that more. So there it is. There's the book. <laughs> so the book is an attempt to think um, about the relationship between two senses of atmosphere. The affective and the um, meteorological. And what it tries to do is to use the constraints of a particular object, a balloon, if it wasn't obvious, um, to try and think through and tell stories about how atmospheres in these two senses are disclosed, modified, uh, transformed through various practices of experiment across different domains of expertise and experience, from art to the military to science uh, to scenes of popular cultural life. And I could have been developing this for far too long. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to kind of letting it go um, quite soon. But as I was nearing the end of this book, I started to think about how, not just about the relationship between two senses of atmosphere, but the relationship between kind of three versions of the elemental. And actually, I only realized what the book was really about when I was nearing the end of the final chapter. Um, but I didn't have the time to go back and rewrite the book. But it's actually a lot to do with these three versions of the elemental. So the first version, is perhaps the most um, familiar. This is the elemental as a kind of environmental milieu. Yeah. So the elemental is air um, and water in which various forms of life are developed and to which those forms of life are exposed in different ways. So thinking about this sense of the elemental um, as a geographer requires you to have some grasp of the <coughs> kind of physical dynamics, but it also um, is important to think about how variations in those physical processes uh, shape and are um, show up uh, in, in ways that affect uh, <coughs> bodies, that impact upon bodies in different ways. Okay, so that's the first sense of the elemental. The second sense is a bit more reductive. Uh, this is the elemental as a kind of physical, chemical uh, entity or process. The elemental is kind of diagrammed in the periodic table, and the properties of which a whole range of infrastructural forms and systems uh, depend. Whether or not that's um, the helium in uh, uh, MRI scanners or the helium in the discs that allow Netflix to keep its its um, streaming service going, because the helium keeps those storage discs cool. Okay, so the whole range of elemental infrastructures that are also interesting. A third version of the elemental is perhaps more speculative. Um, this is the elemental as an ontological proposition about the nature of things that exist. So this version of the elemental is very ancient. It can be found in, uh, for instance, the fragments of writing by uh, Empedocles about fundamental substances of which the world is composed. It can be found in the kind of aesthetic ontology of Lucretius. Um, and it can be traced through various strands of contemporary philosophy from new materialism, object-oriented ontology, speculative realism, etc. All of which are about propositions about what the world is, about what the planet is, about what the earth is, etc. Equally, this third version of the elemental um, can be traced through various indigenous ontologies and cosmologies. Um, insofar as it poses the question of what it is we include within the category of what Marisol de la Cadena calls Earth beings. In this form of speculative elementalism, wind, water, and rock kind of take shape as elemental things, and in forms that aren't necessarily fully realized in Western legal, philosophical, and ethical systems.
So as I came to the end of this book, um, I realized um, that what I was doing was, again, trying to think as much about the relationship between atmospheres as it was about working across these different senses of the element. So what I'd like to do today is to think about how this relation between these three versions of the elemental might be understood infrastructurally. And to do so, be this very, very straightforward and apparently simple object, the balloon. And I'd like to foreground this relation between these three senses, or three versions of the elemental, as something that's infrastructural in different ways. So we've seen recently lots and lots of work in the social sciences and humanities about infrastructure, um, about its promise, its problems, its politics, and the various opportunities that it affords us for thinking in a distributed, more than human way. And much of this work, quite rightly, focuses on the politics of infrastructures as a kind of technical system, <coughs> albeit in ways that implicate the system in various forms of life, whether or not that um, refers to the undersea cables that sustain much of information flows across the world, um, forms of pipes and cables, in, in this case in India, and more generally about what it is that infrastructure as a problem and as a technical system offers to us if we want to think about troubled times. But there's also a kind of loosening and unsettling of the concept of infrastructure. So rather than just something that's narrowly technical or socio-technical, infrastructures have become ways of thinking about the affective, gestural, and cultural dynamics of the worlds we inhabit. And so now it's possible to speak of a mood as infrastructural, or to think of infrastructural feelings, um, to borrow from the work of uh, Rebecca or Rebecca Cole. One of the most important sources of support for this latter way of thinking about infrastructure is a writing by Warren Berlant. For Berlant, infrastructures are not quite the same as systems or structures, but are what she calls the patterning of social forms. They are forms that bind things together in a world of movement. So we can take much from this. It offers important ways of thinking about the affective infrastructures that organize transformation. After all, infrastructure is, as Berlant also writes, so I quote, the living mediation of what organizes life, the life world of structure. And as an aside, it's worth noting that life world is an interesting term to choose here. It's a term with which many human geographers um, will be familiar a term associated with an effort in the 1970s to foreground the human experience of space and place in contrast to some of the work that had existed in the decade before that, which was largely about a positivistic, scientific approach to geographical processes. I don't think Berlant is trying to articulate exactly the same vision of the life world as those humanistic geographers in the 1970s, but I do think that given her emphasis on cultural scenes, and that's what Berlant does, she's a, a scenographic um, cultural analyst. She examines cultural scenes for what they tell us about the world. Her sense of, uh, of the emphasis of cultural scenes maybe veers a little too far away from a more kind of post-phenomenological or more than human version of infrastructure life, to which many of us would want to attend as part of any diagnosis of these troubling times. So I, like others, would want to hold on to a way of thinking about infrastructure that remains attentive to the properties and capacities of things and materials. And I'm not saying that Berlant doesn't allow us to do, that, to do that. But what I'd like to do, I'd like to think about is how her argument invites us to think about a way in which forms of gesture, movement, performance, as well as moods and feelings might become part of the pattern articulation of infrastructures whose capacities go beyond the sorts of scenes that she is so good at thinking about and analyzing. So, and the way I'm going to do this is via a, a relatively simple act. The act of um, releasing a balloon. And this act foregrounds, I think, a little of what is at stake 
in efforts to think about infrastructures for troubled times. And this is because, in part, of the glitch in this act. So, if you read um, Berlant's piece in uh, EPD uh, on infrastructure and commons, you'll remember that she's very, very interested in how the glitch, or what she calls the glitch, discloses conditions in which forms of affective infrastructures are, dis are, are, are foregrounded, intensified, or transformed. So the glitch does not so much unite us, um, but it provides a glimpse of different infrastructural capacities that don't simply rehearse a version of what she calls cruel optimism. So the glitch in this scene is the fact that the act of balloon release, balloon, balloon release is now um, recognizes a deeply problematic part of a wider political ecology of things. And this isn't anything new. It's something that's rendered brilliantly in Elizabeth Bishop's poem, uh, Armadillo, where she writes of this kind of scene during a period in the summer months when illegal fire balloons are released in Brazil to the <coughs> saints, their paper chambers flush and filled with light, the balloons that drift up, receding, dwindling <coughs> solemnly and steadily forsaking us. But in a damp draft, these very same balloons can suddenly turn dangerous destroying the nests, habitats, and bodies of animals. So in so many jurisdictions, particularly Brazil, the release of balloons, whether fire-fueled or helium-filled, is now either regulated or prescribed on the various, on basis of the various threats it poses. A simple connection is being made between the active balloon release and the fact that at some point, this object will show up surface or materialize somewhere. Once released, a balloon might descend, and depending upon the material from which it is fabricated, may become more brittle, may shatter, and may fall to earth in pieces. Even if not, some of these balloons will return to earth and become entangled, sometimes lethally, in different forms of life. So the act of balloon release reminds us of the glitch as a moment of infrastructural transformation insofar as it foregrounds our participation in the circulation of materials that contribute to the generation of toxic elemental mediums. But it still might be useful to think with this act, even if only imaginatively, in order to explore how and precisely how the affective infrastructures of scenes of cultural life become entangled with more elemental infrastructures. Thinking infrastructurally in these terms is about now exploring what Berlant calls the way in which objects are granular and moving towards each other to make new forms of approach from difference and distance. So this is what I'd like to do. To think about how this act helps us move towards, through various forms of difference and distance, a kind of thinking about the commons. And in what remains, I want to offer what's rather a drifting kind of account. By that I mean, it moves from scene to scene um, in a way that suggests a lack of direction or dirigibility, but there is, there is a method. Um, it's also rather speculative, not least because the accounts I draw upon are fictional. No actual balloons were released in the preparation of this presentation. Um, and much of the longer chapter upon which this, this is based um, largely consists of, of reading cultural scenes. Um, and those scenes foreground grief. And I choose grief because it's a really important way in which the affects of troubled times register in bodies. And it also reminds us how acts and gestures are implicated in infrastructural feelings. So grief is an infrastructural feeling. And what I want to do is dwell upon how the infrastructural feeling of grief through the act of balloon release becomes entangled in other infrastructures in such a way that makes us or helps us think about the notion of the commons. In the early 1980s, I remember watching, without really understanding, a TV miniseries called The Martian Chronicles, adapted loosely from a book of the same name by Ray Bradbury. 
not quite a novel, but much more than a series of isolated stories, Bradbury's book is vaguely, vaguely episodic, without a sense of narrative sequence implied by the term novel. Particular scenes from that TV series linger in my memory. In the first, the owners of a diner established on Mars in anticipation of the arrival of a large workforce of miners watched through a telescope as the Earth explodes in kind of a nuclear Armageddon. As they absorb the impact of what has happened, a voiceover continues. A million years in the future, a million light years away, some civilization will perceive a brief flickering in the heavens. Will they notice that what we have is worth preserving? No, a falling star perhaps, and their telescopes will continue gazing into the universe, but we will be gone. Something about this scene seemed to resonate with me. It must have been something to do with the atmosphere of the time, something to do with how, at the age of eight or nine, the prospect of the end of the world was all too real, something about how, even in early 1980s Ireland, the possibility of mutually assured destruction generated a background atmosphere within which childish dreams of the future came to make sense and were rendered fragile, made to feel palpably finite. Such a sense of finitude was layered with and complicated by a sensibility shaped by a vision of the afterlife derived from Irish Catholicism. The possibility of living on after the end of the world, after the end of the body, was also real. It had the felt reality of a promise rendered in various representational and figural forms. Angels existed. Dead relatives had merely gone somewhere else. Thunder was God moving the furniture, and the sound of it was, by ominous, something heavenly. So the plausibility of the promise of an afterlife explains by a second scene from Martian Chronicles seemed to linger in my memory before I returned to watch it on YouTube. I remembered it as floating blue orbs appearing before speaking to humans. In fact, when I looked at it again, the scene features Episcopalian priests who travel from Earth to Mars, looking for new sins to absolve. <laughs> the creatures they find on the planet take the form of luminous bright orbs, beings who have transcended physical form and in the process have escaped from sin to live in the wind and sky. And when they finally speak, they reveal themselves as eternal things, living apart from all other beings. Angel life. The orbs reject the offer by one of the priests to build them a church. <laughs> Having no need of any housing, any protective envelope, they live their lives to the condition of their exposure to the elements. So, in Bradbury's story, as part of the Martian Chronicles, an encounter with these woes generates a memory for one of the priests, Father Perry. He starts to remember Fourth of July celebrations. He starts to remember dim faces of dear relatives long dead and mantled with moss as his grandfather lit a tiny candle and let the warm air breathe up to form the fire. So the story from which this scene is drawn is based on something that's autobiographical for Bradbury, his own memory of Fourth of July celebrations. Bradbury, then five, would light and release fire balloons with his grandfather. He describes how the balloon would whisper itself fat with the hot air rising inside. And he also remembers that he just couldn't let it go. He needed to wait for his grandfather to give him a gentle nod of the head before he could at last let the balloon rip free up past the porch, illuminating the faces of his family. So through their light and heat and the capacity for ascension, the fire balloons in Bradbury's accounts are what we might call devices for doing atmospheric or elemental things. They create a glow that edges a collection of things and people with a halo of occasion. For the older Bradbury, and for Father Peregrine, and for others, they're also experienced as the kind of conjuration of absent presences, precipitating memories of long dead relatives. They are reminders of what is no longer present. And I quote from Bradbury, once released, it was another year gone from life, another fourth, another bit of beauty vanished. And then up, up still through the warm summer night constellations, the fire balloons had drifted. 
while red, white, and blue eyes follow them wordless from family porches, away into deep Illinois country, overnight rivers and sleeping mansions, the fire balloons, the wind blow, forever gone. So, Bradbury's stories foreground how the simple act of balloon release is infrastructural to effective space times of experience and memory, and in Berlant's terms is infrastructural because it organizes a transformation in life work. Something that's minor and modest, but nonetheless transformation. It's transformational because it's luminous ascension into an aerial and heavenly beyond embodies the promise of transcendence, the promise of some kind of afterlife that nevertheless remains in the present as a possible object of recognition or as the shape of a feeling of what things might become. So thinking about this kind of act is certainly more complex than foregrounding or dwelling upon a happy kind of object. It's to think about loss, about grief, about the disappearance of time, bodies, and persons. It's about thinking with the elemental condition of love, about exposure to the otherness of the world, to the condition of finitude, and to whatever is excessive of finitude. And in drawing our attention to this condition, the simple act of release invites us to speculate about what it means to let go of whatever it is that might not be able to be held. <coughs> Elsewhere, Sarah Ahmed reminds us that happy objects, or what she calls happy objects, can also be things whose presence is shadowed by loss. Frequently understood as a happy object, the balloon is associated with things that are far from festive or fun. Indeed, notwithstanding its prohibition in many jurisdictions, balloon release remains one of the more common practices used in popular acts of memorialization to mark the death of a loved one or the anniversary of his death. In this case, to mark the death of the child Alfie Evans in Liverpool. So a balloon offers a different set of possibilities in this regard than, say, a bench. Much more so than a bench, the balloon um, amplifies the sense of lightness, absence, and loss. The bench is a gesture towards persist persistence, while a balloon release gestures towards something more fleeting, impermanent. Nothing much of it is supposed to remain after its release. In theory, at least, the balloon once released is often never intended to persist as an artifact or a memento. And the space times of experience it gathers are less obviously site specific and more <coughs> atmospheric than something placed like a bench. It embodies a way of thinking about going home, of a release from the earth, a promise that remains so central to the material cultures and affective geographies of death and dying, and of mourning and grieving. There seems to be an especially strong affinity between balloon release and the death of children. The information on the website of the UK-based Balloons for You is typical of how the value of balloons in this context is at home. Balloons released at a graveside or outside a crematorium are a growing tribute to conclude a funeral service. And this is a quote. It helps give comfort and depending upon your faith helps to symbolize the soul or spirit rising towards the sky and the letting go of the physical presence of a relative or friend. Releasing the balloons and watching them ascend is a very poignant and solemn act of saying goodbye to a loved one. This is particularly memorable for children at a funeral. Her relatives can write messages onto paper notes organized and collected up a day before the service, which are then rolled up and inserted into the balloons before they are inflated. So the popularity of this practice is not only due to how it symbolizes transcendence. The presence of these kinds of balloons give color and density to the atmosphere of a shared occasion. They become a cloud of affects, hope, grief, joy, and happiness around which various feelings can cohere. Holding onto the balloon functions, functions to generate a sense of the presence or memory of the person, and letting go a sense of the freedom and the transcendence of that individual. Equally, release can and has been described as akin to the letting go of grief. 
Indeed, such is the affective resonance of balloon release that it's frequently used in books written for those coping with grief. And a search on Amazon throws up various titles. Balloons for Mary, a children's book about grief and coping with death. The Blue Balloon, Journey Through Grief. Ella and the Balloons in the Sky. Balloons on the Mailbox, one mother's heartbreaking story of her daughter's death. Purple Balloons for Daddy, a child's journey through grief. Balloons to Pawpaw, -paw, letting go of the pain by holding on to the memories. Balloons for Grandpa, White Balloons, a memoir, a bunch of balloons, a book, work, book for grief. So, it seems that something about the act of release makes a difference. Too many people continue to do it for it to be otherwise. We could say it's all about the symbolism of the act, about the hope for transcendence, but it's also something that turns around the feeling that something might show up somewhere for someone, for something, even if it will never be us. When I was young, I prayed before I went to bed every night. I prayed in what, following Patricia Clough, I now understand is that peculiarly metronomic style of repetitious Catholicism. I prayed for people who had died, and whenever anyone knew I had died, I would add them to my list, a list that grew longer, which came to be ordered in a manner that linked chronology with proximity. So it began with my grandparents, and tailed off with neighbors, including a boy next door who had drowned, friends of my parents, people I had never met, but somehow felt some sense of affiliation with. Eventually, there were simply too many dead people to pray for but I was absolutely sure they were all in heaven. And I was certain they were all together, that they had found each other, that they had realized the dream of the ultimate congregation of humanity. I don't believe this now, but I sometimes feel myself missing the promise that underpinned it. I missed it when you asked me that question one evening after bedtime stories about what happens when we die. Who finds us? I missed it when the void opened up by that question was too much for me to face. The exposure was too much. I told you that someone would find us. We would be found. In October 2012, Reiner Gumpreich, 68, found a balloon with a note attached to while he was out picking mushrooms in Vester Capone, Germany. The message read, in support of Karina Menzies, you will be missed. You are such an amazing person, RIP. Lionie, Nikki, and Megan, and Karis. Karina Menzies, a 31-year-old mother of three, had been killed a few days earlier in an alleged hit and run in Eli, Wales. The balloon bearing the message has been released in Harvard. Perhaps because I have children, I get to watch a lot of animated films. I often get to watch the same film on more than one occasion. <laughs> Some films don't bear up to such repeated viewing, Angry Birds, for instance, but a few do. One of these is Up, oh, a 2009 Disney Pixar film. The plot of this film may be familiar. Carl is a balloon seller whose wife Ellie passes away and they have shared along a childless marriage. Remembering the dreams of travel they shared in the early days of their relationship and facing eviction from a home now surrounded by a large urban development project, Early on in the film, Carl concocts a plan. He will travel to Paradise Falls, a fictional, semi-fictional waterfall in South America, based loosely on Angel Falls in Venezuela. He attaches thousands of helium-filled balloons to his home, constructing a device for traveling that carries Carl and an unintended passenger, a young, over-eager boy scout named Russell, almost all the way to Paradise Falls. Before the end of the film, Carl and Russell have various encounters with a rare bird, which they named Kevin, and a long-lost explorer from the golden age of airship travel who has become obsessed with finding proof of the existence of this bird, and feels aggrieved that Carl and Russell might prevent him from doing so. There are various ways in which Up can and has been read critically. Perhaps the most problematic is the colonial fantasy it enacts, one that echoes aspects of Jules Verne's Five Weeks in a Balloon. The land to and over which Carl travels is entirely depopulated with humans and repopulated with animate beings of varying degrees of articulacy, talking dogs and screeching birds, 
The land becomes a lost world onto which a personal narrative of redemption and recovery can be projected. Relatedly, through the voyage undertaken by Carl, the film enacts a fantasy of escapism. So for Carl, the only way of avoiding the difficulties faced and endured by people living alone in later life is a form of uh, childish flight of fantasy, uh, of, of fantasy. Equally, by using the balloons to transform his house into a flying machine, he offers a dream of escape from the political economy of urban transformation. Up is also a story that rehearses narratives of the, of the balloon as a, a device for a kind of masculinist mode of traveling, wandering, and adventure. In the film, travel and its promise become substitutes for a lack of children, and after the realization that they cannot have children, Carl hands Elias scrapbook with My Adventure printed on the outside. But they never get to travel, only Carl does. So, up is a boy's adventure story, in which the only real travelers and protagonists are male. But there's another aspect of the film, the way in which it used the properties and capacities of this thing in particular to explore how the feeling of grief is infrastructural to the elemental condition of love as exposure to the world of another. So the film begins with a sequence in which the balloon figures as a childlike object whose allure draws in the two key characters. And what follows immediately, and for most adult viewers, surprisingly, is another film kind of film within a film, in which the arc of the shared life of Carl and Ellie is shown over the course of a wordless four and a half minutes. At one point in this sequence, Ellie and Carl are having a picnic and looking up at the clouds in the sky. One of these clouds forms into a baby, followed by another. We then see Carl and Ellie decorating a nursery before a change in the tone of the music accompanies a change of scene. Ellie, with her head in her hands, and Carl are in a doctor's consulting room. In the next scene, Ellie is sitting in the garden with her back to camera and to Carl. Carl then presents Ellie with the adventure book. They plan their journey, but life always seems to intervene. It's only much, much later when Carl finally remembers the dream and notices how old they are that he buys tickets to Paradise Falls. But before he can present them to Ellie, she falls ill. In her last scene, we see Ellie in a hospital bed and a balloon floats over to her from Carl. Ellie then gives Carl the adventure book. As they kiss, the balloon remains above Ellie's head. The camera cuts to a picture of Carl in a chapel holding that same balloon. So for many viewers, although perhaps not for my children, the remainder of Up is shadowed, haunted by that short sequence near its beginning. The sequence that is a reminder, as philosophers like Deleuze have written, that life is composed of virtuals, of potentials. And yet, as Deleuze's own writing also reminds us, this claim is no guarantee of anything in particular. It's no promise of plenitude, only a promise that something might happen. So what shadows the remainder of the film is the sense of the loss of this potential. The remainder of the film, in other words, is not only about the wanderings of a windblown festive object, but also about how this wandering discloses how grief works infrastructurally to love. So for Carl, there's the grief associated with the loss of Ellie, and the balloon he holds in the chapel might be taken to represent this grief. Equally, the journey of the balloons he tethers to the house, and then with which he almost travels all the way to Paradise Falls, showed the variation in the weight and intensity of this grief. As the helium escapes, the balloon becomes more and more difficult to move, and he has to drag it. He has to jettison some of the material artifacts in order to allow the house to be placed. So central to the affective dilemma of the key character in Up is this tension between holding on and letting go, between the likeness and weight of being and memory. Admittedly, in Up, the tension seems to be resolved in a familiar way. In Up, as in many other scenes of popular culture, grief is or must be made to work. It must be endured as part of a self a process of self amelioration. So, following Berlant again, you might think of Carl's journey as a, a scene of sentimental education. In such a scene, and I quote, death must be meaningful, engendering knowledge that in moving us beyond the finality of another ending, performs and confirms a future in which we are not abandoned to the beyond or the beneath history. 
And yet at the same time, the film also remains haunted by, and never lets go of, a particular kind of grieving for the loss of a life, a life that never was, but could have been. This is an objectless sense of grief. A grief with a minimal hinterland of artifactual reminders. In the film, it's addressed rather obliquely, but there are no tokens or mementos that perform the work of memory in relation to the loss of something that has never really crossed the threshold of public readability around which an atmosphere can gather. For Carl and Ellie, there's nothing to let go of, no way in which either things or that which, we, or that which they might bear witness to might be expunged. So at the center of the film, therefore, is a grief for the absence of a life that can be properly grieved. You know, the possibility and difficulty of negotiating the tension between holding on and letting go is crucial to the way in which scenes of love and grief are arranged. In Berlant's terms, this is infrastructural because it is about the mediation of a life world. But it's a particularly circumscribed kind of life world. It's a life world that gathers around or closes around the form of human life. I'm going to skip over a section. To think with the balloon might help us think about the limits of our sense of grief. The way in which we can grieve a life that is lived in human form, but for us it's a lot more difficult to think about the coming to the end of an it or something that's more than human. Clearly the presence of a balloon is a reminder of an occasion, indeed part of the generation of an occasion as an atmosphere of shared sensible relationality. In that sense, the lunar release might also be seen as a form of prayer, one framed by religious notions of transcendence, but it need not be framed thus. It might be understood as a kind of gratuitous offering, one born of the effort to generate a relation with some opening beyond relation, an opening that also serves to, as a reminder of the difference between things that is not itself a thing. So it's possible for me to grieve the loss of that towards which a balloon might be moving but can never reach. And while I cannot grieve the balloon in the same way, to reside in the space between holding on and letting go of the balloon is to be in this spacing of the elemental exposure to something apart from me. So to begin to draw things to a close. What I'm trying to suggest is the event of balloon release is a scene around which a kind of affective infrastructure gathers, an infrastructure that opens up the relation between different objects of attachment in ways that never quite resolve themselves. But in the troubled time spaces of grief and grieving, the promise of the act of balloon release can help us think about how affective infrastructures in these scenes become implicated in others and in ways that might continue to trouble us long after these scenes have faded. So clearly these scenes may close in on themselves. They may become ways of renewing the possibility of a form of human transcendence. But even if only speculatively, these scenes can also take us elsewhere. They can foreground how the infrastructural feelings of grief and of grievability and the scenes that they gather around are facilitated, facilitated by other infrastructures. <coughs> infrastructures that are more elemental. Infrastructures that mix the distributed space of palpable exposure to the fine finitude of the human with the material politics of life in a more than human world. The infrastructures, for instance, that produce, extract, store, and distribute helium. The very geological structures in the earth that generate this helium through a process of radioactive decay. Or the wind and its implication in the spacing of grief via the act of balloon release. So we can think of wind as infrastructural to the spacing insofar as it facilitates the distribution of an object that generates the possibility of transcendence. In thinking about the other infrastructural implications, 
we might be drawn into the orbit of a, a particular version or vision of the cosmos, in which different senses of the elemental are held together in tension without being reduced to any one definition. That's a notion of the common. Wow, that's interesting. Take us a copy. A, a notion of the commons in which those three, three different versions of the elemental, the um, environmental media, the physical, chemical, and the speculative proposition are drawn together without being reducible to one another. So a sense of the commons, a vision or a version of which is developed by Berlant, but in Berlant's argument might not be quite attentive enough to the sorts of infrastructures that go beyond cultural scenes. So if, for Berlant, commons is a kind of um, action concept for thinking infrastructurally, what I'd like to do, or what I'd like to suggest, is that we think more about the infrastructural relationships and entanglements between these scenes, the sorts of scenes that Berlant wants us to pay attention to, and this scene below, and the juxtaposition about the infrastructural feeling of grief and how it gathers and organizes, organizes a space-time of um, uh, uh, collective action. And this scene below, the kind of ungrieved form of life um, that is thoroughly and absolutely implicated in this scene below. So thinking about infrastructures for troubled times, and I'm going to end quickly because for some reason the rest of my paper is not there. Um, uh, thinking about infrastructures for troubled times is to take the troubled space of grief and readability and to link it with this kind of troubled scene below. Okay, thanks for your attention. in my own work, um, specifically through, through my work on endurance and care in former Soviet nuclear town in Lithuania. And um, Derek's work and also his reflections on Berlant's work have been really useful in rethinking the material, experiential and affective aspects of infrastructural forms. Um, I want to bring up a few points from this paper, and particularly in its conversation with Berlant, as a means for setting some themes for the day ahead. Um, and also to provide some further thoughts around what infrastructural thinking can do or offer to the humanities and social sciences. Um, so I'm going to pose a number of questions, and I think there's a few contradictions in these questions too, and, and a few sort of conflicting ways of thinking about things, and, and I just want to leave them there really um, to open up the space for discussion. Um, so the first theme I want to draw up is, is about expanding the concept of infrastructure. And as, as, as Derek asks, how can the elemental, the non-human, the liveliness and the properties of matter inform the way in which we think about infrastructural relations? Um, so so Derek identifies three forms of the elemental. There's the milieu, the, the sort of generative chaos from things emerge, which is, I suppose, a, similar to substance in Spinoza. Um, as, as a sort of condition for engagement. Um, and then there's another sense, which is to do with properties, capacities, and affordances of matter, and thinking about what this means for objects, bodies, gases, liquids, and forms of life. 
And thirdly is an ontological proposition that speculates towards new entities and beings. Um, so um, Marisol de Cadena was mentioned there, but also I think um, Pominelli's work on the geontological also draws on this stuff. Um, and I think these each and together provide important provocations for thinking about infrastructures as gatherings, as complex articulations of materials, bodies, imaginaries and forms of life. So these ways of thinking about the elemental encourage particular and perhaps more expansive readings of infrastructure. Um, and there's a critique in here too, or perhaps um, I think maybe a supplement to Balant's work, um, which, which you're suggesting is based very solidly in the human. And I think perhaps there's an interesting question here, which might concern the extent to which there is a residual humanism in the way in which we're trained to think about infrastructure. Um, both in Balant and in, in, indeed to other emergent writings on infrastructure, which it obscures the enmeshment that infrastructural thinking can help us to make visible. And I'm thinking about um, Ash Amin's work on the liveliness of infrastructure on Monday socio-technicalities that shape well-being, sociality and organisations. And also Jensen and Marita's work where infrastructures are described as open-ended experimental systems that generate emergent practical ontologies. I think here what, what we've got is a recognition of the materiality of, 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 of such entities, but at the same time, um, they are seen as interesting insofar as they are impact on human activity. The human is never far away. And, 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 and perhaps we can think here about how they might also impact on other beings, other entities, other materials, other elements. Um, and these modes of thinking too open up questions about speculative forms of life. They draw together entanglements between beings and other entities and create new ones. And there's room for speculation in infrastructural thought. So maybe that's something we can also hold. Um, so I'm asking what does this loosening or unsettling work on infrastructure offer the environmental humanities or STS or the social sciences more generally? And what happens when we begin with infrastructure, with the stuff of infrastructure rather than its causation? Um, I think that's an important point and, and it brings me to my second question, which is really a response to this expanding out of the concept. And, and what I'm wondering is, are we convinced by a concept of infrastructure that, that can incorporate the gestural, the performative, the molecular act of releasing a balloon, um, those forms through which we make life livable, but also the grand project of modernity? Um, so infrastructures are changing, they're becoming more digital, more technical, more atmospheric in terms of how they condition experience. They're self-generating entities, self-organising entities. They change molecular relations as they change the Earth. They participate in planetary changes of the Anthropocene, in increased levels of radioactivity, in the altering carbon cycle, in extinction. But I wonder, when we discuss, for example, um, in the Lance paper, Spar's poem, This Connection of Everyone with Lungs, or Derek's discussion of the release of balloons, of the value of thinking these forms in the same register as thinking, for example, of a massive road project. What does it do when we push these things together, the molar and the molecular? What inflections can it also obscure? So my question really is whether the term, as it's expanded, perhaps becomes too broad to be precise. Are we in danger in operating in so many registers that we might flatten the political topologies of infrastructures out into the glosses of entanglement and connection, and in doing so lose something of the relative densities of power through which they operate? Third question um, concerns infrastructure and commons and the relationship between infrastructure and the commons and the benefit of thinking these terms together. So both Derek's paper and, and the Lance paper draw on the concept of the com commons in order to think about infrastructure and draw out a tentative politics of a shared world. Um, 
Thinking about infrastructures as political technologies reveals the rationalities underlying technical projects. And this has been the focus of much scholarly work in this field for some time, some of which you mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, the socio-technical assemblages that participate in world-making infrastructures produce and discipline subjects. They speak back. They operate as articulations of forms of power, those grand schemes of modernity, vast energy, water and transportation projects. Larkin's work in particular discusses the work that's done through infrastructural provision in building nations, in bordering, in territorialization, and in the production of imagined communities. The electrification of the Soviet Union is one place in, case in point. And such infrastructural forms are inextricably bound with progress. Larkin too writes of the feelings of promise that infrastructural technology stimulates. We cannot separate these from progress narratives, but also from their others. Indeed, our effectual relations to infrastructure, their seductive force, is part of their political effect. These are the aesthetics in sort of Buck Morsey and Benjaminian terms of infrastructure, the structuring of experience, <coughs> the unbearable modernity of infrastructure, which cannot escape from narratives of progress and expansion. The progress of the narrative always lies at the heart of these imaginaries. We want our infrastructure to be shiny, techy, functional and big. We want it to work. So if we understand infrastructure as reflective and generative of political rationalities, how can these expanded understandings of infrastructure contribute something more to the socio-technical analysis of infrastructure? And also, what happens when big infrastructure falls or fails? When those barely visible material articulations of the public become altered or ruined through privatisation and technological phase-outs? And what happens when the state's infrastructural schemes fail or are purposefully let to ruin, or where certain groups are left out? Like debt, the public becomes private, the material spaces we share attract from view. What does this do? We share less. What then happens to our idea of the public? Belant is essentially arguing that the contemporary critical concern with the commons is not a form of prefigurative politics, not some horizon of futurity, but about the articulation of loss, the articulation that something that has held us has gone, and that we need to inhabit a space of ambivalence where this loss is lived through, made visible, patched over. It's a form of staying with the trouble, or what Belant calls managing the meanwhile. It's about finding ways to stay in something, staying bound to the ordinary, even as it, some of its forms of life are fraying, wasting, and developing offshoots among types of speculative practice, from the paranoid to the queer utopian. That's right. Infrastructures here mediate the organisation of life, the material, social, affective structures, decaying, broken, cobbled together, immaterial, the fantastical, that move us towards the bearable. Perhaps this is about trying to cling on to the idea of the public, or find a new way of filling that space. For Belant, austerity is a glitch. It doesn't bring about a new order. It opens up a loss in, a, in the present that needs to be plugged or patched as a means of living on. Practices of commoning point to what's broken. The commons here is not figures to come. It's about learning to live with the present, about building infrastructure to endure a broken world. But at the same time, infrastructural formations can participate in the production of emergent communities. For example, in Derek's talk, we have the, the increasing awareness of planetary forms of entanglement, when the balloon's demise affects other species in other places, and this juxtaposition of images right here is um, convenient and present. But what also of the pirate, the hacker, the commoner, what about the makeshift, the diminutive, the making do, the improvised and the decrepit? What about those infrastructural forms that emerge from the ruins of modernity's grand schemes? That occupy spaces that are left behind or laid to waste? Or operate under the radar of capture by capitalist accumulation? These are the others of these progress narratives. The material articulation of persistence, endurance, living on. Infrastructural thinking can also concern itself with the emergence of new forms of commoning, 
of being with and entanglements. Commons as providing a means for being with in a non sense. But sometimes I wonder whether this too is just a nostalgic call for a lost community that sits firmly within a capitalist imaginary. There's a danger in venerating the makeshift, in romanticising a pre-modern or perhaps post-fall pastoral imaginary that celebrates the ruination of the grand scheme and finds solace in these spaces of struggle. So we need to be cautious before latching on optimistically to Balance Glitch, while it can disclose ways of living with that don't simply rehearse cruelly optimistic promises, it doesn't only do that. It can foster forms of dissociation, abstract, abstraction and endurance that ties us into false promises even more soundly. The glitch is not a moment of transformation alone. It patches over and obscures too. Final point um, is concerning affect and care. Um, and my question is, what's the relationship between infrastructural processes and effective forms of life? How does such projects bring us together? How do practices of care, memorialisation, and politics take places, take place around these processes of progress and innovation? And I think thinking about infrastructure certainly calls into view practices of labour and care. As the anthropologist Laura Baer puts it, they can be the ground for the imagination of relations to other humans and to technical objects. In her wonderful ethnography of the Huli River in India, she charts the effects of the extraction of state infrastructures, suggesting in an Laurentian sense that infrastructure contributes to the emergence of a generation of care for the world. And as such, she documents the collective practices and rituals of the shipyard, the enmeshments of love and labour that organise bodies, machinery and waterways. I think there is an idea of a public, a collective, that the very materiality of its ruination, either through obsolescence or redundancy or through lack of investment, causes people to find means of compensating for. The object is a figure for something more. I'm interested in phone boxes. I'm interested in the practices of care through which these objects are maintained after their lives, in what happens in their decline. Is it the object that we love and contest? Or is it the publicness that it instantiates? We're hungry for public things, as Bolly Honig points out. And that's why, when the privatisation of everything in technological phase-out leaves public phone boxes as ruins, people step in and replace them with community defibrillators or miniature libraries or use them as public greenhouses. There's a need that's being articulated here for things in common. Finally, I just want to say something a little about troubled times. It would be great to consider in our conversations today what we mean by this and what it, what it does to think about these times and these times in particular as troubled. How does this trouble manifest itself in and through bodies and other entities, and we've spoken a little about grief as a form in which this trouble makes itself apparent in bodies. And also to think with the trouble, what can infrastructural thought make visible about such times, and how can we build upon an expanded understanding of the term to compose or articulate relations that gather things in common, and attend to this, this gathering of the present ethically, experimentally and joyfully. Yes. So, um, thanks for those fantastic comments. Um, mm -hmm. I wish you'd give my comments before and then I could give the paper afterwards. <laughs> um, and and there's, there are many more than um, three or four questions. <laughs> um, so, so one of the most interesting uh, issues, I think, is um, to what extent the concept of infrastructure can be expanded to the point that it allows you to think about things differently, but doesn't dilute to 
um, the point of meaning to us is its value, um, which, which is not a, a, a problem specific to the concept of infrastructure. Um, you know, it's, it's a problem with the concept, say, of rhythm. You know, most people start thinking about rhythm. Rhythm is everywhere, and of course, what rhythms. Um, and I think infrastructure is, is similarly problematic in that regard. Um, and, and the value of a way of thinking infrastructurally in terms of uh, the affective um, is particularly interesting in this regard, I think, because on one level there's the risk that you start to frame affect, emotion, feeling in vaguely mechanistic terms, um, in terms of pipes and cables, um, and uh, that's kind of an exposure to a certain kind of critique of thinking about um, the affective. However, on the other hand, if you think of the affective as just as material, or just as much a matter of the stuff of the world as, you know, this stuff, then it becomes interesting to think about it in infrastructural terms. And, and, you know, lots of people do think of the affective in those terms. Okay, it's as material as anything else. When you experience grief, that's a material impact on your body, or joy, or hope, or whatever. And that's, you know, I challenge anybody to say that that's not material. Um, so, in thinking then about affect, and the affective infrastructural terms, in infrastructural terms, um, I think you can take that concept and use it to think about how um, the ways in which affective space times are held together is a kind of infrastructural process. And that's why I'm fond of talking about Irish Catholicism. Um, because well, let's leave aside grief, but guilt is a kind of infrastructural feeling that holds together um, a, a kind of uh, a collective. So, to think about guilt yeah, and the operation of guilt as an infrastructural feeling is to think about power and about why and how it becomes impossible to do certain sorts of things under certain conditions. Um, and I think in that sense, it's useful to think infrastructurally about the affective. Um, and I think that's why Berlant is so interesting, because she's very, very attentive to the fine details of the operation of um, certain sorts of feelings and certain sorts of scenes. But, but it, it, you can't extend it so far that it just becomes everything is infrastructure. You have to think about how a particular feeling works to organize a life world or to transform that life world. Um, that project then might be linked to the analysis of the introduction of a certain uh, more conventional infrastructure. Um, so, so, so thinking infrastructurally isn't necessarily about the kind of objects to which you attend. I think it's about what sorts of processes and how you organize your thinking about those processes. Um, at least that's, that's it's not about juxtaposition of an object and a non-object, but what it is um, that organizes the objects to which you attend. That's the kind of infrastructural dimension you might my view. You made a really, really, really interesting observation about false promises. Um, and that's a really interesting question, is how do we know what promises are false? Um, like, it's relatively easy after the fact. That system failed, or that didn't deliver its promise, but, but um, it's actually remarkably difficult to know in the midst of something that is offered to you as a promise, um, whether or not it's kind of false, or how you recognize that, that um, as false. Um, the concept of the commons, you also talked about that. Um, and the importance of not, I suppose, rehearsing a vision of a nostalgic worldview. Um, and that we should be cautious. And I agree. Um, but I think what is interesting about the concept of the commons, um, and I like the term that Berlant uses, it's an action concept. It's, it's a kind of a way of 
unsettling the relations that we assume to be common amongst us. Um, what's, what's interesting about that concept um, is the way in which it leaves room for nostalgia. Um, and, and like grief or wanting to feel that you belong, I mean, nostalgia doesn't go away. And, and that's what I was trying to suggest. I miss the promise that underpinned my sense of an afterlife. I don't believe in an afterlife, but I'm nostalgic for that promise. So I'm, I'm, I'm still interested in how our forms of common for commonality are underpinned by promises that we know to be false, but yet remain as feelings that still participate in how we organize ourselves in the world. So that's kind of, that promise is still infrastructural to my feeling about the concept of common. Um, uh, I don't know what you're going to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think that with, yeah, it's a good to open it up and then if you have any comments about the book. Now we're kind of running over, but maybe, you can, yeah, five minutes, if anyone has any further questions or comments. Can I just say thanks again to Leila for such fantastic um, responses? Yeah, first a comment. I think we have an infrastructural problem here to care. Because if we close the door, then it's noisy, but then if we, if we open the door, it's not like... Yeah, I can feel that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of not of the dryer. Yeah, maybe it's opening the dryer or improving the air space. Uh, and I, I have like one question and one comment. The question is about, uh, about the image that you show about, about Brazil. Uh, because I didn't get... Maybe it was at the beginning and I, I was processing this slow, uh, slowly. But it was a kind of commercial by Petrobras. About can you uh, give some context about about that image and the way it relates? You you just you said it, but I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. They sponsored an ad campaign to um, discourage people from releasing firewood. Yeah. Um, so so um, their release is illegal. Yeah. Um, but it's also been associated with various fires. Um, so the, sorry, the ad is yeah. Um, this is supposed to be a fire balloon, and it's holding an axe. <laughs> uh, so the idea is that the release of this kind of balloon, uh, this kind of balloon, starts far as fire, and that is, um, uh, it, it, it kills. Which is, in some ways, a you know, a commercialized representation of the sorts of things that Elizabeth Bishop talks about in her much earlier poem. But this is just a representation of the threat that this kind of um, object is uh, presumed to pose to wildlife, to resources, etc. But it's, yeah, it's sponsored by... Is that... Mm -hmm. but, but there's a kind of subculture of um, uh, you know, creating really, really elaborate uh, fire balloons. Um, uh, but technically, it's illegal. <laughs>